Hi, everybody. Um, we're going to be reading from James chapter 5, beginning at verse 7. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the, Lord, the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. Thank you, James. Well, good morning, everybody. Great to see you all and be seen this morning. Welcome to church. Sun's out. So over the rain, it's good to be here. I hope you enjoy all that today brings. Yesterday afternoon was a bit of sun as well. We got out and walked, and so did everybody else. It was nice to see everybody come out of their homes. Hey, before we get into the message this morning, I want to talk about something exciting and special coming, in the, coming up in the life of our church, and that is Alpha. Alpha is an eight-week course for the spiritually curious and it's coming up soon. Each week at Alpha, we host it on Monday nights. Each week, we do three things. We get together and eat an awesome meal. Hospitality is a big part of it. Get together and eat an awesome meal. We watch a short video with some great topical content, about 20-odd minutes. And then we grab a cup of tea and discuss the content. And let me tell you, it is a fantastic opportunity for people to ask questions. You see, Alpha is a great place. It's a safe space for people wanting to explore the big questions in life. Who is God? Can I have faith? What's the deal with the Bible? Could I pray? All those kind of things. If you've got questions, this course is for you. If you know people who have questions, this course is for them. Our next Alpha course is coming up next term, starts on the 9th of May. And uh, as a church, we're going to be preparing for it together. You see, the Alpha Course isn't something a few strange people do at the church, right? It's a few, few people who are just really excited about evangelism and witnessing. We leave it to them. No, no, no. At this church, we do it together. doesn't mean everybody will come on the course, but we're all going to be doing it together. So over the next sort of month or so, we're going to be making lots of noise about the Alpha Course. I'm not going to apologize for that. And we're going to be talking about how together we can partner with what God is hopefully going to do through the course. One thing you can do is pray, and we're going to talk a lot more about that in the coming weeks. But the thing I want to plant the seed with you this morning is this. You can invite someone. Who can you bring? You can invite someone to Easter. That's awesome. Hey, come to the Easter, Easter celebration on Sunday. It's going to be amazing. You can invite someone. You can also invite someone to Alpha. I know that sounds like totally scary because we can get rejected. We're going to be talking through this and helping you through this, okay? Thinking of fun ways, creative ways to do that. But you don't have to have all the answers to invite someone to Alpha. You just need to extend the invitation. And that's something I think we can all do. So who could you be inviting? I'd love to plant that seed with you. Next week, we're going to get very practical on what that looks like. But right now, just plant the seed. Alpha starting in about a month. Who could you invite? Okay, exciting. Alpha, bring it on. Well, we are in our second last week in our great series in the New Testament book called James and the series Faith in Action. And as Matt spoke about before, we are talking about the topic of patience this morning, faith and patience. This is a topic that I feel absolutely, enormously underqualified to preach on patience. My grandmother used to say, David, patience is a virtue, probably when I was exhibiting very impatient behavior. Patience is a virtue. It sure is. I wonder if you think of yourself as a patient person. 
If you're not sure and if you're married, go ahead and ask your spouse. This is not the time to be elbowing them in the, in the ribs, okay? In this series of James, we're, we're applying the word to ourselves, not to other people. Do you think of yourself as a patient person? I'd be surprised if, if many of us think this is an area that we can't grow in. I reckon all of us, you know, we can grow in this area. We can grow in this area of patience. But maybe like me, you're a little afraid to pray for patience because you're afraid of what God might do. You're afraid of how he might answer. To quote the deeply philosophical film, Evan Almighty, which is uh, the sequel to Bruce Almighty, uh, Morgan Freeman's character, he plays the character of God. I think it's a great fit, really. Who doesn't love Morgan Freeman? He says this, if someone prays for patience, you think God gives them patience? Or does he give them the opportunity to be patient? That's, I mean, Hollywood gets it right every now and then. More opportunities to be patient. This is why I am afraid to pray for patience. You feeling it? In this passage today, James tells us patience is a key ingredient to the Christian life. It's key. This is faith in action. Remember, that's what we're talking about. Faith in action. A real faith lived out every day needs patience. But here's what I don't want to do today. I don't want to guilt us into feeling I'm not very patient. Come on, you're not very patient. You need to be more patient. Let's pray. Because I don't think that's very helpful. It doesn't help me. It probably won't help you. Instead, what I want to do this morning is explore why it's so important. Why do we need it? I also want to explore what's, what's the danger when we struggle with patience. And then I want to have a look at the power for patience. How can we do it? What's the fuel for patience? How do we do it? How are we actually able to be patient in this life? So let's do that together. I think I need it. I don't know about you. Let's do it. We're going to jump into our passage for today, verse 7, starting right here. Be pa- Very, very simple and clear instruction. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. Very simple and clear. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. Now in the section before this, we're looking at 7 to 12 this morning. In the section before this, verses 1 to 6 in chapter 5, we'll just look at it really briefly. James has some pretty hefty things to say to wealthy and powerful people. Not just rich people, but rich people who've hoarded their wealth. They've put their hope and their security in it. They've made it their treasure. They've made wealth their ultimate. James says, poor decision. It's going to rot. It'll corrode. Your hope is misplaced. But more than that, more than that, James has said to wealthy people who act like this, people who prize amassing their wealth over everything else, they've grossly overlooked their responsibilities to the poor. Most probably people in their employment, right? You have a responsibility to the poor and people in your employment if you are wealthy. He says in verse 4, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. James is saying to the rich who hoard their wealth, you have lived a life of luxury while benefiting off the back of people you're exploiting. But you know what? God sees. He hears. He knows. He's not going to let these things go unpunished. So a massive warning to the haves, a massive warning for wealthy people who exploit others. Then he switches his attention to what we're looking at today. He switches his attention to the poor, the downtrodden, the Christian, because most likely a good deal of the people he's writing to in the first century are these things, right? They're poor, they're displaced, they're being taken advantage of, and he's got a message for them. What are they supposed to do in this situation? What does he say? Verse 7, brothers and sisters, be patient. Brothers and sisters, Be patient until the Lord comes back. James does not say to these people, 
Now is the time to overthrow your oppressors. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, now is the time to seize the means of production. Karl Marx would have liked that. He doesn't say, now is the time for a revolution of the workers. Now is the time for violence. No, he doesn't say that. What does he say? Be patient. Now, this does not excuse awful working conditions. It does not excuse the importance of fighting against injustice, which is what we can do. But it does put life in perspective for those who are poor, for those in this life who have great trouble. Be patient. Why? Because there is hope. The Lord will return. Jesus will return. Oppressed people can be patient. We're told in verse 4, because why? God sees, He hears, He knows. He's heard the cries of the oppressed. They don't need to turn to violence and revolution, even though that might be tempting, to remedy the situation, because a day is coming when the tables will be turned. When Jesus returns, He will bring the promised justice. It's a certainty Hope is coming. Um, over the last little while, um, I've been experiencing a bit of back pain. Nothing too crazy, but uh, it's been hanging around for quite some time and something probably, you know, guys my age particularly struggle with, uh, a bit of back pain. And uh, it's been pretty sore. I've been seeing physios and doctors, and I've got lots of scans, ultrasounds, CTs, MRIs, the whole gamut. And... Uh, I got a final diagnosis recently, and uh, it's pretty good news, okay? Let me just say, it's good news and interesting news. Okay, stick with me. It's good news and interesting news, right? The good news is there's nothing terribly wrong. No, nothing sinister. There's no big cyst or tumor there or anything like that. That's good news. It looks fairly mild, even though it's painful. So the good news is, as well, it will get better. Here's the interesting bit. It's going to take a while. Maybe one to two years. Whew. So good news. Nothing too sinister. The good news as well is it's going to get better. The interesting news is going to take a while, but it will happen. Could have, I've seen lots of graphs. You know, it's, it could take one to two years. So it will happen, but it's going to take some time. It's a certainty, but it might be a painful road to get there. It's not going to be immediate. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Christians experiencing difficult times, suffering in this life, what are we to do? We have certainty that Jesus is returning one day to remedy everything. Our pain and our hardship are not forever. Now, this doesn't downplay or minimize what some of us are going through. But it does assure us an end will come. And then James says, let's look at an example together. Let's look at the farmer. Let's look at the farmer as an example of patience. The farmer waits for the land to do its thing. He waits for the land to produce the crop, the thing that he's relying on that is valuable to him, He's also waiting on what? The rains. In that part of the world, they come fairly predictably in sort of autumn and spring. He waits for the soil to do its work and the rain to do its thing. Now, I'm a city kid. There are many city kids here, quite a few. Yeah, I, I not spent much time on a farm, by choice, that is, really. And uh, even so, I can understand that the farmer is very dependent on things that are what? Outside of his control, Right? the natural elements, well outside of his control. The ground, it's got to do its thing. The soil nourishes the crop. The farmer plants the crop in the dirt, the dirt does its work. The rain, of course, is the other element without which not much growing is going on. He can do nothing about the rain. He must wait, which is not an easy thing to do. Now, what are we supposed to learn from this agricultural example? Simply, you too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Be like the farmer. 
be patient. How? The farmer waits with confidence, right? The farmer waits with confidence that the rain and the soil will do their work. Patience equals confident waiting, you see? Now imagine an impatient farmer. I can imagine that. (laughs) Me. Imagine an impatient farmer planting the seed and the next day just getting up going, I want to see progress. Putting his eye to to the the, the, the soil line and I can't don't see anything. Next day, go, go, goes to bed. Next day comes out. I don't see anything. Next day comes out. I don't see anything. I don't see any progress. I, and doubts whether anything is really going on. And then an impatient farmer, what they might do is dig up the, the ground. Maybe the, the, the seed is dead. Maybe it's not happening. And what's he going to do in that process? He's going to ruin the progress of the seed. No, that's, that's not a patient farmer. The farmer waits confidently for the soil and the rain to do their work. Now, what is this? What are we witnessing in the farmer? You could, it's what? It's an exercise in trust, yeah? Or you could say faith. It's an exercise in faith. The farmer is putting his faith in action when he waits with patient confidence. Now, I think James uses this example Because the farmer must put his faith in things he clearly has no control over. We've got to do the same. Because our lives are very similar, amen? Our lives are very similar. You can imagine a poor Christian back in the first century when James was writing this. Or a poor Christian in many parts of our world today. Maybe not Australia, but certainly other parts of the world. You can imagine these folks being taken advantage of by wealthy landowners, by criminals, by, by, by powerful people who care nothing about God and nothing about others. What can they do about the systemic injustice of their life? The sad truth might be not very much. So what do we conclude? Therefore, they have no hope. For the Christian, no way. There is hope. This is what we had to learn from today. They have hope. God's promise to that person, it will not always be like this. What about for you and me? Whatever difficulties you and I go through, the truth is some of them, maybe a lot of them, are completely out of our control right? Things we've inherited, health conditions, financial difficulty, relationship breakdown, other sufferings, other hardships. We can have confidence that there is a glorious end to our pain. There is hope. We can wait with confidence. But here's the thing about waiting. Here's the thing about patience. It's not passive, right? The kind of patience that James is talking about, the kind of patience he's advocating for is not passive. It's active. What does he say in verse 8? You too be patient and stand firm. That's active. Stand firm. Think of the farmer again. Now, I okay, I'm a city kid, but I know enough about farming that You can't be a lazy farmer. (laughs) It's a lot of hard work, right? A lot of hard work. Anyone who knows anything about farming knows you're up at the crack of dawn and you sleep well because you're working hard, right? The farmer works hard to fertilize the soil, till the earth, and plant the crop before the rains come, right? There's no point sitting back and waiting patiently for the rains if your crop isn't in the dirt. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, stand firm and let nothing move you. That sounds pretty active to me. Stand firm and let nothing move you. You see what James is talking about here? Determination, which is the very opposite of laziness. Think of, uh, 
It's a bit random, I know. But think of sumo wrestling for a moment. You can maybe call it a sport or whatever it is. Think of sumo wrestling, okay? The whole idea of sumo wrestling is to what? Knock your opponent out of the circle. But what are you trying to do? You are trying to stand firm. Yep, you're trying to stand firm. An enormous person is coming against you, trying to throw you out of the ring. Your job, stand firm. See, here's the truth about life. All manner of things come against us in life in order to knock us off our feet, right? Suffering, hardship, anything comes against us, destabilizes our life and can destabilize our faith. And when that happens, doubts can creep in. Yeah? Oh, maybe God's not with me. I must be doing something wrong. More on that in a second. Questions swirl around our minds. Discouragement can increase. We are to stand firm. But you know what else can happen? In the midst of hardship, in the midst of suffering, you know what else can happen? You and I can become a bunch of whingers. That's what James says. He doesn't actually say bunch of whingers, but the Aussie translation would have that, I think. Don't become a bunch of whingers against each other. That's what it would say. Verse 9, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. When we're going through hard times, you know this, it is all too easy to take our eyes off our promised future and focus solely on just how we wish life was. Am I the only one who struggles with that? I don't think so. I remember distinctly um, the first time that I really read through the book of Exodus. And I read through the story of God's people wandering in the desert. Maybe you know the story. And I just remember being completely and utterly shocked at how much they whinged. God's people were a bunch of grumblers. Absolutely. We're hungry. We're thirsty. We're tired. We're hot. We wish we went back to Egypt. We know we were slaves there, but we were better off. You ungrateful. Mm. I remember thinking that. They had just experienced God do amazing miracles. They'd just experienced Him part the Red Sea, defeat the most powerful army in the world. They didn't lift a finger. God did it. Throughout wandering in the desert, God went ahead of them, physically in their presence with a cloud at night by fire. He made water come from the rock. He made food come from the ground. But you know what? They didn't focus on that. They chose to grumble. They focused on their hardships. You know what? Just thank goodness we are nothing like that. Thank goodness. Unfortunately, we know just how easy it is to do this. Man, and what's the fruit of it? It's not good. Often we grumble against each other. The fruit of it is what? Bitterness, resentment, broken relationships. But instead of grumbling, we can remember a couple of things. The Christian person has incredible resources when we come against hard times. Don't let anybody tell you different. We can remember lots of things. Let's remember a couple. We can remember this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. What do we need to remember? God is doing a work in you. We looked at this, remember, at the beginning of our series in James. God is building your character. He won't waste anything. 
He's not testing your faith to see whether you might break. No, no, he's making it stronger so you can persevere. But what is James's absolute emphasis in this passage, right, when it comes to patience and suffering? What's our great hope in the face of trials? Be patient and stand firm. Why? Because the Lord's coming is near. Remember your promised future. We talked about this last week, remember? We must live like we know how the story ends, because we do. Live like we know how the story ends. Yeah, sure, this side of heaven, this side of the new creation, we've got to wait. We struggle. We suffer. We've got to be patient. We won't always have to be patient. You think we're going to have to be patient in the new creation? No, we're not going to need it. Victory is assured. It's already won in Christ. But, oh man, Dave, like the Lord is coming near. Just this, isn't Jesus coming back just some distant, far off reality? What does James say about this? The judge is standing at the door. The Lord's coming is near. He is standing at the door. Apparently, Jesus is far closer than we might think. The temptation, I think, might to be his return is just some sort of almost myth-like thing. But that's not reality. That's not the truth. It's just as if he was standing on the other side of the door. You see, he's not delayed. He's not held up. He's not confused. He's not lost right? He's not waylaid somewhere else. He's not forgotten about us. He's on the other side of the door. It could be any moment. There is now little that stands in the way before Jesus returns, right? Jesus' incarnation, when he came to earth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, all behind us. In terms of the history, the salvation history, it's the next thing. All right, as we finish up, what else can aid your life? What else can aid my life? What else can aid our lives as we seek to live patient lives of faith? James gives us a couple of very quick examples. He talks about the prophets and Job. He says this in verse 10, brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. In the Old Testament, many of you know this, the prophets spoke for God. They were the mouthpiece of God. And often that was a pretty tough gig. Often their job was to bring people back to God because they'd gone way off. And people rarely thanked them for it. I can't help but think about the uh, prophet Jeremiah, who had a particularly tough gig. Jeremiah, uh, he, he brought the pretty hard-to-hear news to God's people that Babylon, a superpower of the day, was coming to conquer them and take them into captivity. Nobody wanted to hear this. They even got other false prophets to say other things to make them feel good. He even took his message to the king. He wasn't thanked for it. Poor old Jeremiah was betrayed by his own family, beaten and put into stocks, imprisoned by the king, threatened with death, and thrown into a cistern, a well. Whew. Yet through it all, he remained faithful to God, demonstrating patience in a time of trial. Now, what are we to learn from this? It's pretty intense. What are we to learn from the prophets, from Jeremiah? It's this. His experience was intense but it isn't rare. His experience was intense, but it isn't rare. You see, the hardships you and I are going through now, have gone through, will go through, we're not the first. We're not the first generation to go through these things. We're not the first of God's people to go through them. They're not new. We're not unique. This has been a lot of God's people for a while now. 
You see, if we're not careful, oh, I fall into this. If we're not careful, we can make the mistake of thinking comfort and life going well is normal. And then we expect it. And then we kind of think, you know what? That's what I've been promised, right? Comfortable life and all things going well. It is not promised to us. We have a lot of great promises. That is not one of them. You see, we, we can make the mistake of thinking that things going wrong in our lives means something is wrong, when it could actually be a sign that things are going normal. Take heart. You're not the only one. The prophets are also an example of people who followed God through really difficult times and remained faithful, right? See, hitting obstacles in life, it's hard. But it doesn't have to take us out completely, you see? It doesn't have to take us out of the race. Hitting hurdles in life, it means that we might stumble, we might fall over. It doesn't mean the race is over. It shows us we can be patient while suffering. We kind of think we can maybe do only one of those. No. It can be done. The prophets show us it can be done. Our next example is Job. You may know lots or nothing about this man. An incredible story. A whole book of the Bible is dedicated to him. An incredible story of a man who had it all, and all was taken from him. The entire book, over 40 chapters, deals with weighty stuff, suffering, why it happens, the depths of human suffering, who's to blame, is there any hope in the midst of the darkest night of the soul? Great reading. There is so much to say about this, okay? So much. But for today, it's this. Job persevered. Job persevered. And the Lord brought about redemption in the end. You see, Job lost everything full on, right? He lost everything, but he never cursed God. He complained bitterly, and his faith was pretty weak some of the time. But it was still true. And the Lord brought about redemption in the end. He brought about redemption in the end. And we'll, we'll, we'll end in a moment. And he draws our attention, James does, Job does too, to the truth of who God is. Who is he? he is full of compassion and mercy. That's who our great God is. That's who our hope is in. And if that is true, then you and I can persevere till the end. We can. We can persevere till the end. We can wait with confidence. We can have patience in suffering. Because for you and me, there is no greater example of compassion and mercy than Jesus Christ. The one who suffered so that our suffering is not meaningless but has meaning and has a glorious end. Jesus, in his great compassion and his great mercy, he doesn't weary of our weariness. He does not give up on us. We sometimes give up on others. We sometimes give up on ourselves. Jesus Christ does not give up on you. He has promised to be with us. He does not give up on us. He is compassionate and merciful. He is there when we repent of our faithless grumbling. He is there administering, administering rather, His grace with lavish abundance. So, in our moments of pain and hardship, what do we got? We have a Lord that's promised to be with us and says, I will be back. It will not always be like this. And therefore, we can stand firm. Why? We can stand firm because He is the ground we are standing on. Now, friends, we are now going to stop and we're going to do something beautiful together as God's people. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, communion. I invite the ushers to, to hand out the elements. We're going to spend some quiet moments reflecting on what we've heard. 
and what it means to have patience in suffering. As we think on what Jesus Christ went through as he suffered. A wonderful way to remember Jesus' great sacrifice. And while they're being handed out, Marco's just going to play a little bit. I'll hop down, give us a few moments, then I'll come back and lead us through eating the elements and drinking together. So don't, don't use them yet. Feel free to open the packet if you want to and just hold them with you. I'll be back in a couple moments. Okay, everybody got it who wishes to participate with us. Well, in order to prepare our hearts, I'm going to pray. And what it is is a prayer of confession. It's a time for us together to come before God and remember who He is and the forgiveness that He promises for all those who would come to Him. So let's do that together. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, Almighty God, gracious and compassionate, we come before you this morning and we want to say these words. Lord, we admit that we have gone our own way, not loving you as we should, not loving our neighbor as ourselves. Lord, we admit freely that we've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and what we've failed to do. We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbor and to live for your honor and glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let me read some scripture. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So friends, let's take the bread. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Take the cup, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you. Preserve your body and soul to everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the ability to celebrate the gospel in this way, to celebrate your body and your blood shed for us, given for us, so that we could live, and that is a promise. And Lord, as we do this, we proclaim your death until you come. You will come again. We hold on to that hope. We think of those in this world, whose daily life is a reminder of injustice, who are crying out to you. We know that you hear them. 
And we ask, Father, that you would empower us as your people to do something about it. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Inspire us to change this world. And Lord God, for those of us who are really in the depths of suffering now, in the many different ways, help us to hold on to hope. It won't be like this forever. You hear us, you see us, you journey with us, and it will come to a glorious end. May we look to you. We fix our eyes on you. In Jesus' name, amen.